September the 11th was the day that everything changed. It was an ordinary day, sat at your desk, everyday experience, and then suddenly you were in the middle of a war zone. I literally just sort of got one foot out the elevator and it was just like and I was thrown across the corridor. I, I had to lean really back with the camera. I, I, I could hardly fit it into the viewfinder. The top three floors had started to peel away. So I now knew that the building was beginning to collapse. And I swung the camera around and started to run down the street. He said, run, run, run for your lives. So that's what we did. I'd been in New York for two weeks and I started work in the World Trade Center on September the 3rd. The views were spectacular. I had this wonderful view of uh, the Statue of Liberty out of my office window, just sort of looking down direct on it. And yeah, it was, it was pretty amazing, actually. I left my apartment about 6.30, and it would have been a 15-minute walk, maybe. And I got in, and there was an email from my father. So I emailed him back, and he was like, oh, you're in the office early. And I said, oh, yeah, I've got a lot to do today, kind of thing. And I was like, it's really quiet. Um, and I looked at the clock, and I thought, well, there should be some people here by now. And I went um, to my door and just looked up and down, and there was nobody, none of the secretaries were in. I came back to my desk and glanced at my clock, and it was 8.45. I was literally head down, riding away, um, just cementing the contract, and then suddenly... <laughs> I was thrown against the desk. Um, it kind of rammed against my ribs. It was clear that something was exploding, but whether it was like a gas tank, you know, or, you know, whatever it was, I had no idea. I couldn't breathe, and the building just seemed to be tipping further and further forward. The floors were vibrating as, you know, obviously the impact went down the structure. I, I was clear in my head for that split second that the tower was going to go down. I've been in New York for three and a half years studying um, at art school over there, and then I found out about the artisan residency in the Twin Towers, which was on the 91st floor of the North Tower. We were basically painting views from, from the studios. I was just like, I can't believe this is somewhere that I'm, I've got the opportunity to paint from. I was very lucky. It was a strange feeling being up that high. Surreal, really, I think. I'd had a really good day on the Monday so I was really keen to get there early morning on the Tuesday. So I got up at four, made the ferry, and made my way up to the studio and um, started painting. And the light that morning was just amazing. It was the perfect, perfect sunrise that morning. It was beautiful. Come about just after eight o'clock, I was thinking I wanted to go and call a friend of mine who was coming to visit the studio that afternoon. And I thought I'd get hold of her early, but then I was like, no, I don't want to go down because I'm really enjoying my painting and the light could change by the time I come back up again. But I thought, no, I've been painting a couple of hours, take a break, go and get a juice or something. So I went down, called my friend, 
one of the security guards stopped and was chatting away. And I'm like, no, no, I have to go. And so, because the elevator was just, just open. So I got in the elevator and I remember someone pressing 93rd and I pressed 91st. Um, and it was just as I stepped out, I literally just sort of got one foot out of the elevator and it was just like <laughs> And I was thrown across the corridor. Smoke and debris just blasted down the corridor. Um, again, no idea what was going on. I think it was the shaking of the building that just suddenly made you feel very vulnerable because you can't just open the door and step out. I stood up and I don't know why I did it, but I instinctively turned and looked out of the window to see what was going on. Things were, were starting to fall past my window. You know, there was um, chairs and office equipment. There was this woman's shoe. It was just drifting down and I, I just followed it with my eye. And then in fairly quick succession, I discovered that um, people were being thrown out of the building. There was this one particular gentleman. Um, I have no idea whether he was alive or dead. Um, and I just caught his eyes. And there was this look of horror on his face. I was just sick to my stomach. And I was just stood there, unable to move, just washing this. I could hear voices at that point. Um, and I was like, I, I didn't know where the emergency stairs were. So I went um, to go and join them. There was one receptionist, Rosemary, who I knew. When I joined them, they were having a discussion as to whether or not they should stay or whether they should leave. I was the most senior person there, so I kind of just took control and said, look, um, whatever's happened has happened above us. Um, we need to leave, we need to leave now. At this point, you're acting on instinct, and the instinct was to get the people who were standing around moving. We were by an emergency stairwell, and everybody started to go off, and I went over to Rosemary, and I was like, it's going to be OK. You know, just you have to take it slow, take it down the stairs, and um, I'll see you outside. I was of the view that there could be other people trapped on our floor, so I stayed and kind of jogged around the, the you know, the floor, um, opening doors, seeing whether people were stuck, you know, underneath desks, um, anything like that. Nobody was hurt or trapped. Um, everybody had, had left, so I was the last person on my floor. As I left, there was water running down the front of the freight elevator. And for some reason, that got my attention, and I'm, I'm not sure why. And I looked at it, and I'm suddenly aware that it's fuel. I was like, what idiot would store fuel at, you know, at the top of a skyscraper? It was at that point I could hear an explosion. I think I was in shock at that point. I just couldn't figure out what was going on. There'd been electricians working outside the studio. They came running around the corner, and it was that direction the smoke and debris had blasted. There was an empty office behind us, so we all decided to go into the office to get away from the smoke. We were all lying down low to keep away from the smoke. None of us had any idea what had happened. Already the survival instinct kicks in of how to get yourself out of the situation that you're in. But internally, I know there was a feeling of severe panic because of being so 
such a long way up, you feel sort of helpless. It was fire escape, that's all that was in my head, it was we need to go to the fire escape. And I don't know how I'm going to get down, but I want to get down and I want to get out of here. I'm a British filmmaker and I was in New York with a crew of eight making a documentary series for an American network. We were living two blocks away from the Twin Towers. I was working with a great team of people in a great city and everything was going well. A guy came in and said the planes hit the Twin Towers. It wasn't unusual to have planes that close and that low in lower Manhattan. We just thought it was the light aircraft that had an accident and hit the tower. Being the journalist, I started to get itchy feet and I knew, you know, my wife was down there and the rest of the crew. I immediately picked up the camera and uh, uh, we started filming. We couldn't see the Twin Towers for about five minutes uh, until we got down near the United Nations building, which was a mile down the road, and then they appeared. And we couldn't believe it. I said, wow, look at this. This isn't an accident, and this isn't a Cessna. Then we looked to the right, and we could just see the towers burning, but, and we saw these little black dots starting to appear. And we just looked again and I was, we said, what's that? And it was people jumping. So we knew then it was very, very serious. We made our way through the back alleys and actually got into West Street uh, underneath the South Tower, um, literally underneath it. All the time I was filming fire engines and ambulances arriving. I saw this blue car arrive and a fireman uh, got out. There was a guy called Steve Gregory who was the deputy fire commissioner. He was setting up the um, command and control post for the incident. So as a filmmaker, I thought, well, this is my Steve McQueen. This is Towering Inferno. This is the fire chief. This is the main guy. I went over and said, do you mind if I film you? And he just nodded back. I knew from their reaction to what they were saying that this was very, very serious. You've got the two tallest buildings in the world on fire. You'd also got two major airliners that crashed, and there we were, there, underneath it all. I mean, it was hard to comprehend all that. threw my rucksack over my shoulder and headed to a stairwell. And the first one I came upon was the different ones to the one the others went down. And I was like, I, I don't know where the other one is, so I, I'll just go down this one. And I just thought, OK, I'll just carry on going down this stairwell and just you know, reach the ground and, and walk out. Unbeknownst to me, um, some stairwells didn't run the entire length of the, the building. They stopped at the 44th floor, which is the elevator floor. It was a scene of utter devastation. Um, it, it was terrible. No words really can adequately describe, you know, the scene of horror before me, and I found it kind of difficult to comprehend the magnitude of what was happening. When I pushed open the door, I was facing an elevator, and the doors were open, but the inside was burnt out, and it wasn't empty. There were some corpses, um, and one of the elevator's doors was open slightly, probably just two or three inches, but smoke was coming out of the, the doors. But the thing was, the smoke was coming up through the doors, 
which made me realize that the building was on fire below us now as well. And I was very calm. I wasn't upset, I wasn't scared, but knowing that the building was on fire below us, it became much more apparent that this may not be a straightforward exit. first few floors were just smoke and debris. Lights were out and sprinklers on. So it's wet, it's slippy, and just more and more people filtering out of offices. Some injured, some not. And people would move to the right to help them get past, to try and get down a little bit quicker. It would just sort of be one step at a time, very slowly. If, if people stopped for too long, uh, someone would shout out, don't worry, people congestion. I remember only getting to the 60th, 60th floor or something and thinking, I'm not even halfway. And it just seemed this endless, because you're in a sort of funnel, just making your way out. But I think I just disappeared into my own, men, my own escape. It was just like, right, I need to keep moving, to feel that you're, you're getting out or you're getting somewhere to keep moving. So when we were stopped for too long, it'd feel quite a little panic. At one point, um, when we were all stopped for quite a while, I just suddenly started to feel a bit claustrophobic and a bit trapped. It was very somber, um, and up until that point, I don't think many people had a clue as to what was going on, but then there was a gentleman from about the 74th floor, and he was behind us, and he was saying that a plane had hit the building, and that it wasn't a small plane, that it was, you know, a jetliner. I was like, okay, that explains the explosions, that explains the fuel on the door, it explains why there's fire below us, um, it's one of those things that I'd always kind of wondered how I'd ever react in like a car crash or something like that, whether I'd, I'd be like screaming and running around or I would be cool, calm and collected. And I was very calm. I was thinking things ahead as, you know, what needed to be done, you know, potentially. When I worked in England, uh, one of the things that I uh, worked on was new construction and doors had a 45 minute fire time. So after 45 minutes, you know, your time was up. As we reached each door, I would very discreetly put the back of my hand against the door. Um, and as time was ticking away, I was thinking, okay, we have to get down in this 45 minute span. I thought the building had reached the point of no return. Um, that the fire was clearly widespread. I knew it was, uh, the building was on fire above, below, and now around, and that they were gonna just give way at, at any point. Jill and Linda and Kim kept wanting to stop because they were tired, and I was like, come on, we've, we've gotta keep going. But as I was putting my hands on the doors, they were getting warmer. And about the 24th floor, it was hot. And we just stopped. We just suddenly weren't moving. And that was the point that I thought, okay, we're not gonna get out of this. People say, oh, you know, the lives flashed before them. And that wasn't like that for me at all. It was like, you know, what do I re regret? You know, what are things that I wish I'd done or done differently? And the first thing was that I wish I'd told people more how much I loved them. And, you know, we're very English um, and reserved. And we say, oh, well, they know. But I was like, well, they shouldn't make that assumption. I should have told them. The second thing I regretted was that I had the Hugh Grant floppy fringe thing. And 
I was like, I've wasted an hour every morning doing my hair. It, why did I do that? And then the third thing was I'd never had vodka. I was 34 and I'd never tasted vodka. And I was like, why was I so uptight? And I was very calm. I, I wasn't upset. I wasn't scared. There's no other way of describing it, really, other than just calmly realizing my time was up. Water was cascading underneath one of the doors, and the stairs were flooded. The water was quite powerful. You could feel it pushing your calves. But at that point, it just suddenly freed up, and we got down, you know, that last 20 stories in really quick order. And we were all kind of like, 11, 10, 9. Um, and then we got down to the ground floor. I pushed the door open. And just instinct, I, I couldn't say anything. I just put my hand to stop them leaving because the scene is so beyond anything that anybody should ever see. There were people um, dead all around us on the floor that had been cut down. Some had clearly been caught in an explosion. There was danger um, everywhere with glass, fires, explosions. I had just assumed that we would exit outside, but that was a stupid assumption. Stupid, because the stairwells were in the central core of the building, so there was no way it could exit outside. It became clear that how we were going to cross the lobby was the most important decision of the day and probably would determine whether we would live or die. We had to make the best possible decision to increase our chances of survival. It wasn't a question of, if we go this way, we will live. If we go this way, we will die. It was like three bad options, which is the best, because when we ran for the escalator, we still could have been cut down by glass. It was very much a life or death decision, but death could have been the option whichever way we went. I decided that running to the escalator was the safest option and um, trying to use you know, the underground shopping center as a way to escape. So I scooped you know, the three ladies up in my arms and just kind of ran and kind of pushed them in that direction. And we got to the escalator, and it was clear that it had collapsed. There was a big drop. So I jumped, skidded, but didn't fall. And then I turned, and the others jumped, and I caught them, and I put them down. It was really dark down there, and, and we started to, to wade in water, and the water was well above their knees and coming up to my knees. The storefronts were blown out. There were um, wires hanging everywhere, sparks. As sparks hit the water, there would be an explosion. I kind of turned, and a spark must have hit the fuel. There was a fireball kind of in front of me. I was blown back. I hit the water, and my head went under the water, and that was the last thing I remember. I remember coming around to the last few steps and seeing light come in. And so I was thinking, oh, finally, daylight. I mean, that was a sort of relief because you're just going down, down, down. And it was an amazing feeling because it was just like, oh, finally, you know, I've made it out from this funnel. I had no idea what I was about to see ahead of me. Something horrific was going on because it was just, I mean, as far as you could see, there was just, Everything just wrecked. 
I remember seeing some body parts underneath rubble, things that just don't, wouldn't want anyone to see. The officers just telling us to, to move, move, saying, don't look, don't look, move, move, move. It was just going into another mode. You just go where you're told to go. They'd walked through there early that morning and now drudging through water. And again, still not really knowing, knowing something huge has happened, but not knowing what. The first thing that, you know, I then remember is run, run, run for your lives. So that's what we did. You know, for the first time, we really, really ran. And we all reached the street and we all turned. And it really was like a scene from a disaster movie. A lot of people were sitting down, um, relieved that they'd got out. To me, I didn't have a doubt in my mind that the tower was going to go down um, and that we were in danger. I felt quite a buzz inside me. I was very excited about it because I knew I was there with a camera. I couldn't see any other cameraman and I knew I was like on the spot. But I was still trying to remain calm. I, 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 you can't flap in, in this job, you know, uh, especially if you're trying to hold a camera steady. I'd been filming about 20 minutes, and it was about this point, there was an almighty explosion. It sounded like a bomb going off. I panned the camera around and looked up. And it was so high, I, I had to lean really back with the camera. I, I, I could hardly fit it into the viewfinder. What I saw was just amazing. The top three floors had started to peel away. So I now knew that the building was beginning to collapse. And it was just spreading out like a big umbrella coming over towards us. I could hear the firemen starting to run down the street and I realised I wasn't going to be in the right position here. And I said, I remember shouting, Lulu, Lulu, run, let's run, let's run. And I swung the camera around and started to run down the street. The sound was amazing. I mean, it sounded like 20 jumbo jets on a runway coming towards you, roaring louder and louder and louder. I couldn't see what was happening, but my camera could. I'd, I'd, turned the camera around and it was looking. I couldn't see what was coming. And the next thing I remember uh, was being overwhelmed with something and the camera leaving my hand in slow motion. Everything went black. I was just coming out of the building Something made me look up as I stepped out of the building, and I looked up and I just saw this big dust cloud coming down on top. The feeling was just silent and slow motion. I'm gonna get trapped under this. I've just got to run. So at that point, just made very um, quick decisions on trying to think how to hide and get away from it. I saw people going down into the subway entrance, um, so I thought, right, I'll go there. So I started running across the street, and then a blast, a big blast came up from the subway and out. So I sort of stopped and was like, right, I can't go there. So I just crossed the road. And um, at the point that I hit the pavement on the other side, it was down and I couldn't see anything. A lot of people got caught, a lot of people got hit by falling debris. I could hear the screams around me, and that was horrible too, because you're not being able to see 
that you're hearing screams around you. You don't know whether there's somebody right beside you, how far away they are, what's coming, what else is coming down. I don't remember weight on me. I don't remember any kind of, I just remember being in this thick, thick cloud that I couldn't see, you know, millimeter in front of me. I just stopped and um, buried my head down and sort of shoved my top into my mouth and um, just tried to keep breathing. I did feel at that point that that's the point I could die because I couldn't breathe anymore and just felt myself calmly giving up um, because I couldn't fight it any longer. The next thing I remember was crawling and you couldn't see, it was just absolutely dead. There was stuff fluttering around and I could hear thuds and bangs and stuff falling around me still. Uh, but everything had gone very, very quiet. I remember thinking of the kids and things and thinking, these are my last moments on the planet. I thought I was going to die because I couldn't breathe. My mouth was full of this gungy stuff, but I couldn't breathe anyway. There's no air around. It was just, everything had been sucked away by all this. And um, I thought I was going to suffocate. You know, like drowning. I thought that's what it was going to be like. I thought, well, I've got to get out of here. And I was flailing my hands around, and I, I felt the side of a car. And I thought, ah, all the cars are in this area are in the side streets that run down to the river. I thought, well, if I follow these cars, I might be able to get down to the Hudson River and probably get some more air. It was a fight for survival. I knew I had to get out of there. I started to crawl. I went past one car and I came to a second car. I was still crawling and I got to the third car. I felt a leg, um, a tunic, it was a fireman's tunic. And I couldn't see him, I could just, just feel him. And I remember calling out, can I use your bottle, can I use your bottle? I wanted to get some air to breathe, and he didn't reply. He must have been dead. The visibility now started to lift a little bit. And I remember, after I got to the, about the fourth car, I stood up. It was apocalyptic. I mean, there's no other word to describe what I saw. Everything had gone from colour to black and white. The trees were bent over with all the weight of the debris, and what I could see, the street was white in this ash, like a volcano ash. It just looked like that, and, and bits sticking out and here and there. But it was very eerily silent. There was not, no particular noise at all. It was quite quiet no shouting, screaming or anything. Suddenly, I, I was hit with this awful feeling uh, in my stomach. Uh, where was Lulu? What went through my mind was that I'd led her into disaster uh, and I didn't know where she was. I turned back uh, to, to look for her. I started screaming, Lulu, Lulu. Can you hear me? Where are you? Where are you? Nobody replied. It was still deadly silent. I wasn't thinking about myself, it was what's happened to Lulu, you know. Where is she? It's my responsibility. I must go and find her and help her if she's lying there. So I then backtracked down the street 20 or 30 yards where I just crawled to the point where I thought we'd got hit. And there in front of me in the street was the sound mixer that she'd been using. Lulu wasn't there. So I picked up the sound mixer and then underneath that, attached to the cable, three foot down was a camera, smashed to smithereens. 
but then I was more conscious of what was in front of me. I stood up there and saw this uh, apocalyptic scene in front of me, which just like, like, looked like something out of Hollywood. All the fire trucks were on fire, police cars, ambulances. It was just deathly silent. Everything was covered in this ash and girders sticking up and bits of building here and bits of building there. And through all the haze, I could see orange glows where fires were broken out. And then I looked down at this smashed camera and sound mixer. I then looked back up again at the scene and something inside me said, Paul, you've get, got to get out of here. And I realized that I'd actually crossed the line from being an observer, looking at a situation, to being part of it. Something just told me to turn around and, and go back to the apartment 200 yards behind me. And that I did. I just turned around and turned my back on it and walked straight down the street, never turned around once. As I walked down the street, I, I kept thinking, what's happened to Lulu when I was looking? Something said, you've done it this time, Paul. That particular point was horrible because there was a point I felt myself just stopping because I couldn't keep breathing. I sort of heard this voice almost from my stomach that just sort of kicked in and said, no, come on, you can keep doing it, keep breathing, keep breathing. And it was like a, it was almost like a slap on the face going, no, come on, you can do it. I was also feeling around um, with my hand and I felt this figure beside me and this voice said, we've just got to wait here until it settles. And hearing someone beside me was amazing as well. Um, and he took his jacket and put it over, over me and two of us. And I sort of turned and I could see a badge and realized it was a fireman. I think I grabbed him even more <laughs> at that point. And, um, and then it started to settle even more and we saw in front of us this water, just right in front of us, this water pouring out. Um, and then started to see it was a fire engine right in front of us. So we moved towards the water and started to wash our mouths out. I remember looking up and just seeing the sun start to come through this haze. And I sort of felt myself smile. It was kind of like, oh, at least the sun's shining. There was a huge relief because I just made it through whatever was going on, um, but still in total shock. them saying to me, what floor were you on? What floor did you come from? And I said, the 91st floor of the North Tower. And they went, no, 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 no one got out from the 91st floor. But what floor were you on? I said, no, I was on the 91st floor of the North Tower. I still can't believe from being the height up that I was, that I actually did manage to make it out. His building faced south. And even though it was only on the eighth floor, we had a clear, unobstructed view of the tower, and you could see that all my office was completely on fire. At this point, everybody was under the impression that the North Tower was going down. We were hysterical at that point, actually. And without warning, the most almighty noise. And then the top just started to twist, slow motion, and then she collapsed. Three women were on the sofa, and I kind of squeezed in between them, put my arms around them, and I'm like, we're safe, we're safe. Um, we're safe, we got out, we're safe. As I came to the corner uh, of West Street, 
onto where the battery park where our apartment was, there was some photographers came around and started taking pictures of me walking down the street with all my smashed gear and um, I then went into the lobby and first person to see me was Lulu. A great relief came about me and I remember we embraced each other and uh, I think there was a tear or two shed uh, but I hugged her very tightly and said you're okay are you and she said yeah. Looking at this smashed object, <laughs> didn't resemble a camera at all. And I, th I thought, well, I'll see if it works. And I s switched it on and it, it did come on. And I, I rewound the tape and uh, pressed play. And then I saw for the first time what had actually happened. And until that moment, I hadn't seen it. And the camera had seen it all coming down towards us. And then I realised how near to death I'd been. When we started to run, there was about 20 fire officers in that street. And many of them died. So it was a question of which way you ran, that way or that way or that way. It was that close. I survived that day because of key decisions I'd made, like where to go to get away from the, the building collapsing. If I'd hidden under the, the fire engine, I'm, I might not have made it. If I'd gone into the subway, I might not have made it. I needed to make split-second decisions, and I was just very lucky they were the right decisions. It was just pure instinct. My brain was flooded with adrenaline, um, which meant that I had faster reaction times. Things seemed slower, which enabled me to move more quickly, um, to avoid things, to do things. Um, and that was very important, very important. When you're that close to death, your body works at its best, maximum alertness and awareness, and because of that, we lived. The painting that I was doing that morning, I lost. So when I first came back to Scotland, that was one of the first paintings that I wanted to redo. I think because I'd been working on it that morning, it was an important piece for me to recapture. When I look at the painting, rather than thinking of what happened on the morning of September 11th, I think about the experience I had painting in the studios. And I, I think I try to sort of, in some ways, that overrides the tragedy of what happened. The Mark Oliver that walked into that building didn't walk out of that building. Of course, I'm glad of the chance to live and have further experiences, but that's overwhelmed by a sense of guilt. We have our own parameters, what we expect of life. And they were literally blown away that day. I had been very career-driven before, and then I was like, what was the point? Really, what was the point? I think we did the right things at the right time that day. And it was just unfortunate that a lot of people died. And I do think about them. And that, that could have been me, easily could have been me. I was inches away from dying that morning. I didn't. I survived. <laughs>